Yeah, so I'm a dev manager, and the stuff that, that I'm talking about today is, is something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, and what I, what I realized yesterday in one of the talks, someone asked uh, who here is technical and who here are sort of like analysts and stuff. And then I realized I just need to figure out what my demographic is here today. So just, just a show of hands if you're sort of like a coach, um, like on a day-to-day -day basis, coaches. Oh, a lot less than I expected. Um, sort of like analysts, whether you're a business analyst. Okay, product managers, product owners, a few. Uh, developers. Okay, mostly developers and BAs. One. Okay, two. Did I? I said QAs first, yes. Um, okay, so that's the who are you bit. So um, my talk is really about um, sort of like as, as I worked as a coach and as a dev manager, some of, one of the things that I saw quite a lot um, th sort of like across all the countries that I, that I engaged with people was that there's a skill shortage in our industry, right? Um, and that's, that's sort of often talked about. There's a skill shortage. And my feeling is that it's actually not a skill shortage. There's more than enough people. It's an ability shortage. And this talk really talks about f trying to take all the people that we have in the industry and sort of like leveling them up. Um, and that's sort of something that's, that I'm quite passionate about because I saw as a coach and as a dev manager that that is one of the things that we're not doing very well in the industry. So hopefully we'll be able to address that in this talk. So, uh, you know, it's always a bit disheartening when you sit in a, in a, at a conf conference and then someone quotes much better statistics than you. So I'll just quote a really cool talk from yesterday, which was um, the talk um, from Kayla around um, how we live in exponential times and how every aspect of technology is sort of like progressing forward in at exponential rates. And that's, that's actually quite scary in a way, you know, because it, it, a lot of the technology is going to be software reliant and we as an industry have to, to solve that. So one of the studies that I've, that I've originally quoted um, in, in my slides was um, around the future of employment and how susceptible jobs are to computerization. I know Keller quoted some similar statistics yesterday. I'm not sure if it's the same study. It would be interesting if it's different studies because that says something in its own right. And this one study said that 47% of the jobs that we know today um, has a high chance of being computerized by 2023. That's quite scary, right? Um, now, what I mean by, by computerized is that the technology that will be available to computerize these jobs, not that they will not exist. Um, what's interesting about that study as well is that a quarter of the jobs has a 90% chance of being computerized. So one out of every four jobs that we know today won't exist in a few years' time. That's actually quite scary. Another scary statistic is that um, the number of software developers in the industry is doubling roughly every five years. So there's an exponential growth in the number of software developers as well. Everything is becoming software. So like software is eating the world. Um, scary, right? At least we're in the right industry, so that's, that's a good start. <laughs> now the problem is that most of the systems are in disrepair. So if any of you have been in the industry for a few years, you'll know that, that you know, sort of like legacy systems, there's counters of them and they tend to be fairly messy and they tend to be sort of like the number of WTFs that come out of a room is usually an indicator of, of, of that legacy code. Um, so I tried to find some statistics on this and actually found some, some data and, and the data said that there's roughly, now it's a Deloitte study so um, there may be some sales pitch behind this but what, what the, the study basically said is there's, there's about $300 billion being spent on software debugging. Um, of which about 50% of that is spent on architectural defects. So even if that study is remotely accurate, it's still a shitload of money, right? So there's a problem in our industry. Now, over to you guys. So you'll see slides like this with discussion, and then you'll get five minutes or so to discuss amongst yourselves on why you think these are problems, and then you do my talk for me. <laughs> um, so why do you think teams really struggle with this? Why do you think this is a problem, that, that, that legacy code is a problem? And keeping in mind that if we don't fix this legacy code and software takes over the planet, we're going to have a bit of a problem, right? So we need to fix this. So why do you think this is a problem? Let's try to get to the root cause. And you'll have about four minutes to discuss it. There's a timer that's going to run. It starts. Go for it.
amazing, like the hand thing. All right, um, I started seeing people quiet down, so I thought maybe time to, to get feedback. So why do you think teams struggle to keep systems clean? Anyone? It's not sexy. It's not sexy, okay, fair enough. Okay, so there's a economic sort of like trade-off. It's prioritized by the business to, to build features over keeping the system clean, right? Struggling to get stuff done at the end of the time boxes. Uh, struggling to get stuff done within the time boxes. Teams end up rushing. Yep, yep. So companies have a short-term focus over, over a long-term focus. That comes back to, to the conversation around the prioritization. Okay, an architecture doesn't, that doesn't allow itself to, to change. That's an interesting one. It's a first. Um, uh, sorry, just to... Okay. All right, so there's a backlog to make them clean. The systems are quite messy, messy to start off with. Oh, I like that. So we, we find it challenging to talk to the value of it. That's such a so well phrased. So, so we find it challenging to, to talk to the value of it. Um, so whether it is a, a budget thing where, where we don't know how to quantify the, the, the sort of like impact of, of bad architectural choices, or it's a budget thing in terms of business not being able to, to, to make the right trade-offs, um, it, it, that sort of like economic discussion goes back for me to, to a skills thing in that People need to be equipped to be able to have those conversations. And, and it, it, for me, is equipping people with, with those conversations. So there's something around the skills development within people that, that's, that's, that needs to be looked at. Um, and that, for me, touches on, on the economic conversations that we have with business stakeholders around this and how we're, we're professionals. The other part of that is how we actually tackle this from a technology perspective in that many times developers actually, or development teams actually don't know how to approach a legacy architecture and take that legacy architecture and fix it up. And those are the sort of like two things, but for me, both of those things tie back to, to people, right? And, and, and the skills that the people have within our teams to approach this. And like for me, one of the most important things in Agile Manifesto, the history bit of the Agile Manifesto, is that people are our greatest asset. Um, that we can, cannot actually build great software without great people. And the reality is that there's a lot of this information is actually already written about, whether it's around the economic arguments or it's around how we make choices on our features or it's around how we approach our architecture. And just some of the books that, I've, that I could, could think of is listed here. I thought only 10 books, otherwise 10 seemed like a good number. <laughs> um, so if you, if you search on what are the most important books from a product management perspective or from a development perspective or from a process perspective, these books pop up. And I've also sneaked in some of my favorites in there. So just as a, as a thought, sort of a bit of an exercise, if you've read one of these books, put your hand up. Um, probably about uh, two thirds. If you've read two, keep your hand up. Uh, 20%, 30%. If you've read three, a lot less, <laughs> five people. If you've read four, Two people, three people. If you've read five, my hand's also gone down. So if you've read six, wow, dude, you're hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> He's read seven. So the, the point is that this knowledge isn't actually distributed through our, through our industry. Um, I, I, I'm dying to know which is the book that most people read, but I'm pretty sure it's not the same one. Um, so the, the big problem here is this knowledge is there. This knowledge is available on how we apply this. The, the problem is that many of us don't have the time or the space to acquire this knowledge. Um, and if you think about it, all those, those 10 books is about 4,000 pages. It's highly technical, or some of them are highly technical. So you're going to read it twice, at least. If you read it once, that's 50 to 100 hours of reading for an average person. So if you read it twice, it's twice that, 100 to 200, and basic math I can do on stage. Um, so it's a lot of reading, um, and we need to find the time for this. So what can we do within our environments to acquire this, this knowledge, right? So there's all this knowledge out there. How do we help teams acquire this knowledge? Just to have a quick discussion. I think I'll do it about three minutes, um, and then we'll, we'll take some feedback from there.
So that was two and a half minutes. Um, so anyone? We started a book club at work where um, I buy books for people who want to join the book club. And okay. Every Friday we read a chapter. Oh, every Friday we read a chapter, having a book club. That's, that's an awesome idea. I'll take note of that and steal the idea. You've got to give, <coughs> you've got to give people time so, uh, to acquire that knowledge. Give them the tools, the learning systems, but also give them the, the time that they feel that they can go and do it and they're not worried about having to complete the next best, that, you know, a yeah. deadline that they've got to meet. So you've got to say to them, you need to go away from what you're doing and, learn, and take time to learn. Absolutely. Really, really Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, spot on. We, we need to give people the time and space in which they learn. Um, and I'll get back to that in, in a moment. Um, so the other thing we've, we've tried out is how do you, I guess, we're trying to put the head on, I guess, seniority and student leadership to go, so I have a domain knowledge, I have a deep domain knowledge of X, and I can share that. So how do we support you to share that, whether it be through girls or we have those people dotted through squads to help okay. us? Okay, so sort of like just make sure the teams are set up, that the learning happens within the teams. Uh, You're doing lots of paper programming, but I guess it's kind of fun. So that's kind of the knowledge that we're doing. Okay. So, so you said you're doing a lot of prototyping? Uh, pair programming. Oh, pair programming. Pardon. Okay. Pair programming, that helps spread it. More programming as well, if you've tried that out. There was a hand in, in the front here, yeah? Okay. Uh, when a person writes something cool, uh, wants to present it, uh, there is time for people, we're about seven or so, uh, to discuss it, maybe work on a code. Absolutely. Um, so I have, try to present it. I have do do dojo sessions and one more at the back. Okay. That's pretty awesome. So these are some really great answers, probably the, the best answers I've gotten since I've, I've started doing this talk. Um, ranging from you know, creating a book club to just creating space in which people can learn to doing it on a day-to-day -day basis by setting up teams in a certain way and employing practices like peer programming to code dojos and, and dev boot camps. And those are all things that I'm actually talking about in this talk. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to enhance that for you guys. It's fingers crossed. So the, the main problem is that people have lives, right? We, we, so companies sometimes see that as a problem. I don't. <laughs> um, we go home, we spend time um, doing sports, we spend time with our family, we do things other than, than work. There are some people that, that go home and read countless books and hack until the early morning hours, and we need to find a way for them to, to come back to, the, to our teams and, and bring value as well. The second problem is that when I was coaching, and as a, as a dev manager, we, we don't, I don't see companies give people an opportunity to actually get exp experience in a lot of these practices. Um, something like test driven development is a, is a very good example. If you're working on a legacy code base, it's really difficult to start applying test driven development. You, you actually have to acquire um, the knowledge in working effectively with legacy code and in the refactoring book and possibly even the clean code book to be able to know how to tackle that beast. And then only can you start thinking about test driven development. So it's a very steep learning curve and it's quite a high barrier to entry for, for, for many companies or for many teams. So we need to find a way to get people experience, sort of like basic experience and, and, and build up from, from that point. But the key point is we need to we need to grow people within our, within our um, teams. It's imperative that we at, as, as companies take it on our responsibility to grow the people that we have um, and not expect them to go out there and, and grow themselves or even say, well, the problem is our people, we should hire different ones because that's something I've heard quite a lot. And previous times I've done this talk, that was one of the things that I, that I got as feedback. It's like, well, we just hire different people. And the ones we have don't work, so let's find others. Don't like that idea. So in 2011, um, I started a journey um, on learning a little bit about learning. Um, 
And some of the things that you, that you gave me as feedback was things that I encountered. The first was around code retreat. This is the best photo I could find of a real code retreat. Um, it was while we were setting it up. It's not my first code retreat. <laughs> By then I was running them. And it was around 2011. I was still writing a lot of code. Hopefully I'll do a lot of code again. Um, and it was a bit of a scary experience. So who here has been to a code retreat? No one. Okay, so basically a code retreat is a day-long event, usually on a Saturday. You do sort of like six coding sessions, and you solve the same problem over and over. Um, I've actually seen QAs and BAs attend code retreats, so don't feel that it's a dev-only thing. And the whole idea is that um, in each one of those six sessions, you um, pair up with someone else. And my first code retreat, I sat down with a developer, and we started coding, and I learned an incredible amount of TDD from him, and he learned a lot about TDD from, from me. So we sort of like learned from each other, and then I was going to go and sit down with someone else, and I learned a crap load about the Unix shell, and got into Tmux, and Z shell, and Vim, and it was just an amazing experience. I geeked out. And at the end of the day, um, after sitting in six different coding sessions, I felt that I'd learned more in that one day than I'd learned in months prior to that. And that was an amazing experience. So the first learning thing was, was around code retreats. The second one was around code cartas. Um, so you guys heard of code cartas? A few people, oh, actually quite a number of people. So code cartas is essentially these sort of like predefined coding exercises. There's a few sites online. There are loads of hidden slides with loads of links for you to, to download and to try this, so don't worry about that. Um, so you predefined exercises online, and each exercise tries to aim at a different sort of like skill, and you do the exercise over and over and over and over until the problem doesn't become the issue, but the way that you solve the, solve the problem, the way that you approach the problem, that is where, where you do the learning. So code katas are amazing, and I say and more because you get architecture katas, and I found that you can apply architecture katas to um, story mapping as well, and that's really cool. So using um, story mapping katas, brilliant idea. Um, can speak a little bit about that afterwards. And that was the second big thing that I learned um, over the years. And then last year, I came across Coder Dojos, which um, sort of like I got into it from the last end because I found out about mob programming um, when I went to Agile in the US. And mob programming is this whole idea where many developers and QAs and testers on one computer solving the problem together. And the premise is that we spend 95% of our time thinking about the problem and only about 5% of the time coding the problem. So we want to optimize thinking, and that's what my programming does. And my programming comes from Coda Dojos, where we try to maximize learning as a group. And we started applying it. This is where we were in a Coda Dojo learning Elixir um, at my previous company. And we basically went through the Elixir book in two days. And I felt I will, I'm able to start doing a project on Elixir. Um, I haven't had a chance since, so I've lost all that knowledge. Damn. Geek out moment gone. Um, we did the same with Swift. Uh, we did the same with refactoring cartas. And the really amazing thing here was that we would actually have the books with us, paging through it frantically and having conversations about the different decisions that we were, were making. Whether it was technology focused or practice focused, it was really cool. And the premise here is one of the biggest, best ways that, that I've seen us learn as software development professionals is we learn by doing. We do learn by actually applying these skills on a daily basis. And there's actually a whole science around this, and that is called deliberate practice. And deliberate practice are essentially activities usually designed by a teacher for the sole purpose of improving a specific skills of an individual's performance. So if you think about um, drills in, in different sports or sort of like forms in, in music, all of those are essentially forms of del deliberate practice where you repeat things over and over. The, pre the, the sort of like principles behind deliberate practice is that you target a specific skill, um, you repeat it a lot, um, you get continuous feedback, and that whatever exercise is, is hard. It's not impossible, just hard. And that sort of like is what code cartas are. You know, code cartas is essentially deliberate practice, and code retreat and, and code dojos are just different ways of bringing that into, into play. I actually have one of the, the, the dev leads in, in, in the group that I work with. He and his team do code cartas alone every day, um, like before they start working, as just to, to, to warm up for the day. So for like 30 minutes, they do that and they get going. Pretty cool. So the, the second takeaway here is practice, practice, practice. And there are tools out there that can help us. And there's lo like I said, there's loads of links um, for you to go and do some more reading around this um, after the slide. 
So now we need to figure out how to apply this to our companies. Um, given that the previous talk ran over a little bit and that, you know, going a bit slower than I anticipated, I'll give you about two minutes or so to just talk a little bit about how you can take these things and apply it to your different environments. I know some of you are already doing this, so that would be an interesting conversation. Go for it. So I just want to re reiterate some of the points. So we, a gentleman over there just said that we need to make it part of our developer's job description um, that learning is expected of them, and I really like that. Um, we've actually done that as well um, in terms of their sort of like development plans and, and their job descriptions. It's an ongoing job. Um, gentleman over there also spoke about um, <coughs> that we need to have these economic arguments with our business stakeholders. And, and I just want to build on that because I think it's, it's really important. So there are some slides around how we, we sell this. And, and the fundamental premise is that if we don't invest right now, we maximize the, the current value of the, the software, but we make the software less valuable in the future. And so we, we trade off future, future value with, with present value. Um, and based on that, it, it becomes quite a powerful argument to have. And then we spoke a little bit about making time in our sprints, whether it is um, at the end of our sprint um, or during our sprint or, or just finding some way that we, we incorporate time into to our sprints. Um, the one thing that I, that I would like to say around that, and it ties into some of our experiences, is telling, telling a team that uh, we want you to improve and it's okay for you to improve is, is not as effective as actually forcing that time um, in, in, for the team. I've just seen that teams don't take that time on themselves. They feel that they need to work on features. They feel that pressure. They don't feel the pressure of um, uh, learning. Um, because there's sort of like this perception of, I call it developer psychosis, there's this perception that we need to deliver features the whole time, um, even though that, that perception doesn't always exist. So giving them the, the time and making the time I would see as, as two different, different things. So open that time box for them up within the teams. So for those of you that are coaches in, in environments, when I was coaching, the biggest thing that I saw was I didn't have enough, I was only working with teams as sort of, sort of like one, two days a week, and I didn't have enough sort of like depth with the teams to actually see this through. And a lot of the exercises I would choose were quite superficial. They weren't really getting into the, the core skills that needed developing. And I wasn't able to, to like get into each individual person and sort of like figure out, you know, how they needed to be shaped. Um, forward. So if you're working as a coach, my only advice would be to work with the team, identify one or two champions within the team to, to support you through this journey. The other thing is that those champions would have to help you in terms of longer term sustainability. Because the moment I worked, walked away from a coach, the team sort of just fell back into to feature development. And that's sort of like why I joined MYB as well, because I felt that at, from a coaching perspective, it was only limited to this point. It's something I'm really passionate about. So let me go and find a place where I can actually do this full time and work with teams. Being a dev manager is a, has a different set of challenges. But I felt that given the company values, I would be able to, to really get into that, where the company values is around collaboration and sort of like loving your work and, and being passionate about what you do. Um, there's actually quite a cool video where um, we talk about how we approach sort of like work-life balance and, and those type of things. And I'll, I'll publish it with the slides. And it just like emphasizes why I felt that this is a place where I can do that. The other thing that's, that's important for me, and, and this helps me tie it back to, to the company, right? And being able to have some of those arguments beyond just the economic things, is try and find things in your company values, in your company's manifestos um, that, that just ties it back. The other thing that I found was our platform manifesto and given that our company has been around for an, quite a number of decades, we obviously have a lot of legacy code within the environment. So we created the platform manifesto as a, as a guideline for decision making on the te technical decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. And sort of like the top right, you'll see there's nurture the platform over feature delivery. And nurture the platform means that whatever we do, we need to make sure that we leave the system better. But the sort of premise there is we, we actually need people to have the skills to do that. So uh, also use that as a, as a basis for, for me to, to emphasize the value proposition around this. Um, so I, when I started there, um, one of the first things I did was, well, let's start doing this, right? Every Friday afternoon, we'll have three hours. It's sort of like mandated. We'll just do it, and everyone will participate, and everyone will damn well be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> the beatings will continue until, well, until morale improves or something like that. Um, 
So roughly, I thought, sort of like thought, well, we have to mandate this because of my experiences from, from coaching where it just didn't really get, get, get that much traction. And it did work to some extent. We, we got people to start um, pairing across teams, to start learning new things. Um, and some of the feedback that we got was people are collaborating for the first time. They're working across teams. They're getting to learn things that they didn't know before. They're trying out different techniques. And we tried to mix things up, so they really liked the, the variety. So there was a lot of good feedback. And being a manager, like my job is to, to create systems and then walk away and see if the systems run, and it fell to pieces. So I'll talk about that in, in about five slides time. I just want to talk a little bit about what we did initially and what worked there and what didn't work. So the first thing that we did, and these principles are still carrying through to how we're doing things today, is um, we said that deliberate practice, those principles around deliberate practice should be our baseline. Um, we work in groups to encourage learning. Um, we make sure that when we do an exercise, we have a single objective. And that's really important because very often you say like a developer wants to learn TDD and then they try to do it in a new language. Now they're trying to learn a new language and trying to do TDD and that doesn't work. Um, so that's more of a problem when you're doing cartas around coding. It's less so when you're doing cartas around analysis and, and testing. Um, test automation, obviously. Um, so if we learn a new tech practice, let's focus on known technologies, um, work in areas that we need to improve on, and being open to try things radically different, like mock programming, as an example, or coding backwards, for whatever that may be. Um, it just seemed like the right thing to say. <laughs> um, so in terms of the logistics, and this is one of the things that we didn't do very well, is we sort of like said, well, everyone should be involved. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Three hours every Friday afternoon after our showcases and retrospectives. Um, and one of the things that I think is working well is no normal production work unless there's a production outage. And then if it's a coding session, just make sure that your environment's already configured. The, surprisingly, that was one of the biggest issues that we had, was that people were sitting up the, their, their dev environments and not learning. And then finally, when we run the session, um, sort of like remind everyone of the principles. We review what we've done the previous week. Um, we set the constraints for today's exercise in terms of timing, the exercise we're going to do, whichever languages. And we then essentially run sort of like 30, 45, or 60 minute sessions with short retrospectives in, in between. So that sort of like worked really well. And the premise here is that it's imperative for you to create the space for learning, right? However you do that, create that space. Um, then things became a bit shaky, right? So I thought it was going really well and sort of like stepped away and then it sort of like became a bit shaky. And I thought, oh man, I'm talking at this conference. Like, really need to fix things. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, so things became a bit shaky. We ran a retrospective and tried to figure out what's working, what's not working. So things that worked quite well was the teams felt that they were learning, they were having fun, and they were collaborating as a team. The things that didn't work well was they, they all felt that they have different learning styles. So some people actually prefer taking a book in an evening and just churning through the theory, and some other people preferred working with others to learn. Um, whether or not I believe or, or the other people in the team believe that's the right approach, it is the right thing for them, right? And it's up to us to, 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 to show them other ways, and that's, that's fine. But allow people the space to learn different styles. And also one thing that we did was we were trying to do this across three teams, but different teams have different needs. Um, so that was also a thing that didn't go very well. And because BAs and QAs are sort of like in the minority, they always ended up being excluded, excluded in, in some way, shape, or form. And we always had to like proactively design exercises to, to include them. I'll talk a little bit about how we address that. And then finally, some of the more experienced developers and, and QAs and BAs felt that we're focusing too much on technologies and not enough around on, on practices. Um, so, and we, we tried to address that. So the first thing that we did in terms of um, trying to get different styles and, and needs addressed was, we allow teams to, to completely run it free format for them on, on their space. And there is a Friday afternoon available for them to use it. And it's expected that they use at least four hours every week to improve. However they spend that four hours, that's up to them. And then within the teams, you also recognize that there are different people on, with different specific needs and different specific learning styles. So we have one QA person, for example, that wants to become a DevOps person. So on Fridays, he's spending the entire day locked in a room working through pure site videos, learning how to become a DevOps person. Um, whereas um, 
funny enough, this, this area in our office, I went to go and sit there to, to do my improvement Friday, and I found there was a whole bunch of other people also sitting there, just sort of like hacking away on things that they felt was important for them. So they just said they're opting out of what the team is doing this week, and they're going to go and do their own thing. So give flexibility, but make sure that that space is there. That's critically important. And make sure that it, it comes over and over and over that there is an expectation for the people to improve. It is expected of them. It is part of their job. Um, it is not a thing that we're offering them. It's we want them to improve on a day-to-day -day basis. And also make it very clear in their development plans with the conversations that you have as if you're a people manager um, on what their, their areas of growth are. Um, or whether if you're doing sort of like a holacracy type of environment, make sure that your teams make each other aware of where people should grow. That's critically important. The next is that there are actually things that worked very well for QAs and BAs. Um, the, the, what worked well for QAs was they did 30 days of testing. Um, what also worked quite well for them is some of the code cartas um, allow you to do sort of like automated testing type of stuff. So they did code cartas around automated testing. Um, QAs here in this context are actually quality analysts, not quality assurance. Um, and by the, on that premise, we did a lot of uh, cartas around story mapping where um, the QAs would get involved in the acceptance criteria and the BAs would, would get involved in the sort of like product ownership, product management space. And that worked very, very well. And it actually got the entire team to gel. Um, the one challenge is there you can't do it every week because we also need to build our technical skills up. And then finally, around practices versus technologies. As I said, the more experienced um, people on the teams felt that we should focus more on practices because that's long-term investment, where technology is sort of like short-term investment, like the tech that we have around today isn't going to be big in four years' time. Um, so the, pr the problem is a lot of the lesser experienced developers just don't see that value proposition. So that's an ongoing conversation. And the way that we, we fix that, I'll, I'll get it to you now. I just want to finish my point. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Ha. -ha. Examples. Um, so, right at the bottom, I would say there's there's, there's sort of like tools and technologies, um, which is Elixir, C Sharp, um, Java, Node.js, those type of things. Even below that are the frameworks that we use. So React, Hibernate. I can't think of anything because I'm standing in front of people and I didn't realize that. Um, and then on top of that, we would have practices, things like tester and development, refactoring, um, object orientation, domain-driven design, story mapping, and so forth. And then on top of that, we would have processes like extreme programming or Scrum or stuff like that. Um, so the higher up the, the stack we focus, the, the longer term those, those skills have, have value. Um, and that's just a way of, of looking at that. So what we've basically said is, we, well, let's try to find a balance. Like we allow people to, to, to learn new technologies, especially the technologies that they want to acquire, like the DevOps guy or the QA that want to become a DevOps guy. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that he has to learn on Unix and Windows. Um, but we also allow people to, to build their, their practice, practical or practices out. Cool. Why is this slide replied? Oh, okay, that's a mistake. So the, the fourth and final takeaway out of all of this is that we need to keep on experimenting. So the first is, it is imperative that we grow people. And there's a bit of a value proposition at the beginning around growing people. And there's a few hidden slides um, on further conversations that you can have. But it's essentially tied back to your company values or tied back to your, your economics. Um, the second takeaway is there are actually things out there in the industry like code dojos, code retreats, cartas, and so forth that actually works for learning. Book club is probably another one. Um, I just haven't applied it successfully yet, and maybe that's my mistake. Um, the next one is that we absolutely critically have to create that space. So mandate learning, but don't mandate the format or the structure or anything like, like that, right? Make it part of people's job description, as the guy said over there, that we, we need to, to grow people. And then finally, um, keep on experimenting. So this, I just shared my journey with you guys. And it may work for you. It may not work for you. So go and apply these different things and feedback. And let's, let's create a conversation around what is working in our different environments. The, the Dev Bootcamp is something, and the Book Club are two things that I'm taking away from this conversation. So hopefully, there were some things that you're taking away from this as well. 
And as I've mentioned, loads of hidden slides. So there's tips in, in, and there's cartas and everything that you can use. So invest in our people, practice makes perfect, create a space for growth, and keep on experimenting. So thank you very much. Thank you. And